Iran just made a critical mistake and the consequences are coming. And they're going to be harsh, painful, and most likely will bring the end to the current Iranian regime. You see, the October 7th attacks were supposed to drive a wedge within Israel and the Saudis. Now, the Saudis are not a huge fans of Iran. Israel is not a huge fan of Iran either. This was a natural alliance being formed in the Middle East, a place where words and public statements really don't mean nothing. Whenever somebody says something on TV or in a public statement in the Middle East, it's literally, probably, most likely the opposite of what they actually mean. In fact, if you really want to understand what's going on in the Middle East, you got to look at the map of interest, not hearing what people are saying, especially politicians. Now look, the Saudis and the UAE have feared Iran. That was the focal point of why the whole alliance of the Abraham Accords was formed. They have a mutual fear or disdain or hate with Israel against Iran. Now, the idea of the October 7th attacks, which were carried out by the terrorist organization Hamas, but financed, planned, and actually executed from a remote control position by Iran, were to drive a wedge between the Israelis and the Saudis and the UAE. The idea was very simple. Get Hamas to do unspeakable things, get the Israelis to react, and in doing so, you achieve two birds with one stone. Number one, you make the UAE and the Saudis see that Israel isn't as strong as they thought it was, making it an undesirable alliance member, especially one that's supposed to be the enforcer. And the second goal was get the Israelis to respond harshly, as you would expect. And that response would cause the Israelis to be persona non grata, unacceptable, not legitimate on the Arab street, which would cause the UAE and the Saudis to take a step back from the Abraham Accords. Now, that plan completely backfired, and Iran is dealing with consequence of its own, trying to save its own regime. In fact, how bad it backfired? Well, let's take a look at the map of interest, because that's the only thing that matters in the Middle East. Now, let's start with Saudi and the UAE, the United Arab Emirates. These two Gulf countries are extremely important on the global stage because of the energy aspects they bring, but they're also very important on the Arab stage. They're the leaders of the Arab world as we see it today. Now, these two countries have feared Iran well before the October 7th attacks. This was no secret. And with the United States pulling out out of the Middle East, they were looking for a partner with actual force, with brute force, against Iran. Somebody that they can team up with in order to mutually protect each other from Iran. The UAE signed the Abraham Accords first, as you would expect, and the Saudis were supposed to be next, right after the United Arab Emirates, literally a few weeks after the October 7 attacks happened. Now, Iran tried to torpedo this process by causing this reaction that I just talked about, a chain reaction which takes Israel out of the game, making Saudi Arabia and UAE weaker because now they don't have an enforcer on their team. It's not really about Israel. It's about the dominance of Iran in the region. Now, the public outrage was huge against Israel, for sure all over the Arab street, including Saudi Arabia, and I'm sure also in the UAE. People are not happy about what's going on in Gaza from their perspective. But, and there's a huge but here, in reality, Saudi Arabia and UAE are now more scared of Iran because of what they've done on October 7th than ever before. In fact, the entire October 7th massacre that happened in Israel exposed what the degree of fear they should have from Iran and its proxies and the Islamist organizations they financed, which made them realize that, hey, Israel might be dealing with this right now. They might be the victim of this terror, but we're number two and three on the list. We're next. So paradoxically, the whole October 7th debacle actually made Saudis and the UAE fear Iran more than ever before, wanting to get to the Abraham Accords more than ever before, wanting a partner like Israel more than ever before. So if anything, these attacks have not driven a wedge between these countries. They brought them closer because now they all understand how dangerous Iran is. And the final result of this whole process is very scary for Iran because now more than ever, the Abraham Accords are closer than ever to be accomplished. In fact, we're already seeing this cooperation getting tighter and tighter between the UAE, between the Israelis and the Saudis. Just a few weeks ago, the Houthi rebels shot missiles to Israel which were shut down by the Saudis' air defense systems. So even if the Abraham Accords might take some time on the above-ground official level, 
below the table. These guys have already worked like this since the beginning of the October 7 massacres and before. And that's despite the somewhat harsh rhetoric you get from the Saudis about the Israeli operation in Gaza. Just a few weeks ago, they had the Arab summit and they were supposed to pass a resolution against Israel, which got blocked by the Saudis and the UAE. So this alliance is already formed. It's just a question of time until it becomes official. Now, here's the second part, and this is the most important part I want you to understand. You see, the IDF has literally conquered Gaza in three months. They've taken over the north, and now they're finalizing taking over the south, which is a little bit more complex because of the massive civilian population, the two million people that are basically in that area. Now, that's been done despite huge urban warfare challenges, mines, IEDs, tunnel network that was built over 20 years, a whole minefield of crap that was there for the IDF to sink in. And yet, for three months, they've done it. They've done it, and they've done it better than anybody who understands anything about urban warfare has predicted. Now, the problem with this for the Iranians is now the Saudis and the UAE are looking at this and saying, well, look, Israel is a real deal. They just went into Gaza, this hornet's nest, and they've cleared it in three months. So they are the real deal. They can protect us. They're a valuable ally. Again, look at the map of interest, not the words. So the Saudis are now saying, look, we need these guys. They can handle their business. Same thing with the UAE. So again, bringing these guys together instead of putting them apart. And if you dissect the plan of the Iranian regime on October 7th, the vast majority of this plan was not to delegitimize Israel. That was probably 20% of it. 80% of it was supposed to embarrass Israel militarily in a way that shows the Saudis and the UAE Israel isn't the right partner for them because they can't even handle a few guys on pickup trucks with machine guns. That was the rationale not just delegitimize them in the de facto post-attack reaction, but also make them look weaker than what they are perceived to be by the Saudis and the UAE. Now, the Gaza invasion, the way it was carried out by the IDF, did the opposite. The Gaza invasion, which was a masterpiece in urban warfare, including the massive assassinations of Quds Force officers in Syria, in Lebanon, including massive, massive operations that were carried out in the West Bank, keeping it at bay, including the air defense systems that were operated against the Houthi rebels, including shooting down one ballistic missiles in space. All of this have showed how good the Israelis really are. And the fact that the U.S. Navy was parked off the coast of Israel right away also showed the Saudis that the U.S. will also protect this interest if needed. They may not be in the neighborhood as much, but if needed, the U.S. will come with their fleet and they will put everybody in their place. And that, again, was the opposite of what Iran was hoping to get here. All while the Iranians having to deal with bombings in their country by ISIS, all while having beef with the Balochis, with the Pakistanis, bombing in Pakistan, getting bombed by Pakistan, dealing with separatism from the Balochis. This is heating up for Iran a lot faster than anybody has anticipated. So despite getting a lot of credit in the beginning about their chess game, the Iranians have been basically played into a checkmate by the US. Because you see, they've also tried to blackmail Egypt into submission. Egypt is an important strategic U.S. ally in the region and also an ally of Israel, actually. They share a border with Gaza and they have huge military coordination with the Israelis and with the U.S. And also they control the Suez Canal. So what the Iranians did is they actually operated their other proxy, the Houthi rebels out of Yemen, to block the Suez Canal and hurt the Egyptians in order to get the Egyptians to back off and play with the Iranians and not to help serve Israeli and U.S. interests in the region. And despite somewhat of an initial success in the first few days of this thing, it backfired quite quickly. In fact, it fell apart like a house of cards because what the U.S. did is set up a naval coalition that brought the Houthis to the knees. Now they're getting bombarded every day and the Iranians are now just trying to save the Houthis from elimination like they're about to get in Gaza. You know, when you get into a boxing match, you have a plan. You want to beat somebody, right? But when you get repeatedly punched in the face, uh, your strategy kind of changes and now it's just to make it out of this alive, which is where Iran is at right now. They're no longer trying to get regional dominance. They're trying to save some of these proxies before they go to hell. Now, look, you also have the Jordanians in this whole story. We have to talk about them 
Because while Egypt still might be on the fence on the whole post-war Israeli civilian plan for Gaza, we know that this will change quite quickly once the Israelis knock off Hamas. We know that's the only thing that's holding the Egyptians back. The Houthi rebel blockade of the Suez Canal got solved, and now the Egyptians are waiting there hoping that Israel will knock out Hamas so they can work with the Israelis properly without the threat of destabilization in Egypt. I've explained this in the previous video. Now, on the other hand, you have Jordan, which was another target of the Iranians, because you see, Jordan is a very strange country. It's being controlled by a little tiny minority, while the majority of Jordan is actually Palestinian civilians. And the hope of the Iranians' war is to cause a huge uprising in Jordan, which would spill over into its mutual border with Israel, maybe even potentially risking the peace deal between Jordan and Israel. That has never happened. In fact, just a few days ago, we saw some idiot in Jordan open a restaurant and naming it October 7th, which got shut down by the authorities within two days. So the Jordanians are doing everything right. They're keeping the border tight. They're not letting any of this pro-Palestinian stuff get out of hand. So the Iranians failed on that front as well. They had no success in Gaza. They had no success in the West Bank. They had no success in keeping Egypt at bay. And they had no success with Jordan. So now we go north. We go to Lebanon, which is the big car they have, the big ace in the hole, Hezbollah. Now, Hezbollah is a whole different story. In fact, I would say that they're the biggest proxy group Iran operates. They're actually quasi-military. They have armored vehicles. They have massive inventory of ballistic missiles. They have trained military troops on the border with Israel. So they got what it takes to get some blood out of Israel to really hurt the Israelis. Not to strategically defeat Israel, but to cause a lot of pain, a lot of mayhem, hurt some serious infrastructure, not what's happening in Gaza right now. Now, Hezbollah actually is fighting a war of survival internally back home. And that's something that you don't really hear in mainstream media because they're too busy with the surface level analysis. You see, Hezbollah for the past two years has been in serious trouble in Lebanon, which has nothing to do with Israel, actually. Uh, about two years ago, Hezbollah actually lost the majority in the Lebanese parliament. Yes, Hezbollah is an actual political party in Lebanon. And until two years ago, they actually were the controlling party. So they got to appoint a president in Lebanon, which let them be and let them create this paramilitary organization that's completely adjacent to the Lebanese military. Now, two years ago, Hezbollah actually lost this majority in the Lebanese parliament. And now they're struggling. They have to get somebody appointed to the presidency of Lebanon that's going to be friendly to Hezbollah. Otherwise, any normal president that's going to step in is going to say, look, guys, you cannot be a paramilitary organization. We have sovereignty over this country. We have the Lebanese army. Disarm yourself and become a normal, proper Lebanese political party. This is unacceptable. This is the biggest fear of Hezbollah. And this is what they're trying to actually prevent. It's not about Israel. It's not about the war. It's about internal politics. Now, the deal that's currently being formulated with Hezbollah actually cuts Iran out of this. The United States came to Hezbollah through different mediators and told them, hey, look, forget Iran for a second. Forget your sponsor. If you don't survive in Lebanon, you're gone, right? So we'll help you. You help us. We as the United States, with all our resources, with every asset we have, will support your presidency candidate, right? The one that's going to be friendly to you, the one that's going to leave you alone. In return, you're going to pull back from the Israeli border and move north. And that way, we scratch your back, you scratch our back, and then forget about Iran. You can deal with them later. So the Iranians are not happy about that as well. Obviously, the United States meddling with their biggest proxy is a huge deal. But the carrot that's being dangled in front of Hezbollah is huge. And that deal actually may go through, which would essentially eliminate Hezbollah as another proxy against Israel, at least for the near term. One thing they don't tell you about Hezbollah is that it's facing massive, massive opposition from home, from inside. And that's a huge deal for them. So let's see how this thing plays out. But Hezbollah right now has been basically decommissioned by the US through diplomacy. And what about Israel itself? Well, Israel had a few goals in this operation, in this war. One was to take out Hamas. They took over the north. They're about to take over the south. They only have one city left, which is Han Yunus, which is the hornet's nest. Once they take it out, Hamas rule is over. They may not be able to destroy the concept of Hamas, the movement, but Hamas rule will be over once Han Yunus is done, which is a matter of about 30 days. On top of it, there's virtually no more rockets being fired on the center of Israel, maybe a little bit on the outskirts, but they've essentially eliminated the rocket infrastructure of Hamas. 
And on top of it, they're actually taking a slice out of Gaza to protect themselves, which is not only operationally smart for the Israelis to create a buffer zone between their cities, their towns, and Gaza, which is something that didn't happen before, but it's also symbolic because now it shows the Palestinian people of Gaza that every time they start a war against the Israelis, they're going to lose some territory. And we've talked about how important that is in the Middle East. And also, the Israelis just got UNRWA finally defunded. UNRWA, which was a terrorist organization, which is now proven by the Israelis because they had evidence that about 12 people out of UNRWA participated in the October 7th massacres. So UNRWA is now being defunded, which was a huge achievement for the Israelis. They have tried to do this for 20 years. Finally, they got it done. So the Israelis are checking all the single boxes they had for this war. And what about Hamas itself? Well, that's complicated. You have two Hamas. You have the political bureau and you have the military bureau. So the military wing isn't going to give up anytime soon. They're not going to surrender. They're going to literally fight until the last person. Why? Well, because they have 130 hostages, which they can trade in for an amnesty or for some rescue plan or for whatever it is, a get out of execution plan. So they know that they will get out. Sinwar knows he'll get out. Everybody knows they have a way out with the hostages. They don't care how many Palestinians die. Even if all 2 million die in the process, they couldn't care less. They don't care about the Gaza people at all. So they may be fighting, but it's irrelevant because the political wing of Hamas have already given up. You see, the Palestinian Authority is now attacking Hamas publicly, which is something that never happened before like that in their newspapers, in their interviews, talking about how Hamas ruined Gaza. On top of it, the political bureau of Hamas, including Musa Abu Marzouk, was actually making statements about recognition of Israel, about how the Palestinian Authority is the proper representative of the Palestinians, and now these guys from the political bureau just want to get a part of this. The political bureau of Hamas understands that the game is over, and now their only interest is to get a job in the new Palestinian Authority. So the Palestinians here are the real story. What about the Palestinians? Well, now there's anti-Hamas protests in Han Yunus, which is unthinkable before October 7th, which means Hamas is losing the legitimacy on the street from the majority. They may keep their loyals, they may keep their base, but the majority is basically saying, enough, you guys just screwed us. On top of it, according to a recent poll in Gaza, 70% of Gazans actually have a negative opinion of Iran. One, because they dragged them into this, and number two, because they didn't help them with Hezbollah when the war started, they just let the Israelis go crazy. So Iran's influence on the Palestinian street in Gaza is over. And now we're left with one player in this whole equation, which we haven't mentioned yet, Qatar. Now, Qatar is officially beefing with Israel, right? And the reason is because the Israelis won't accept a deal which would save Hamas. Now, the Qataris have a stronghold over Hamas. They want to keep that influence, that clout. The Israelis are saying, we're not going to save Hamas for you guys. Sorry. So there's a beef there, but it's not going to continue forever because once Hamas is gone, the Qataris would love to get involved in Gaza. They would love to keep their influence. And in order for them to do that, they're going to need Israel approval. It's kind of a mutual understanding that the Qataris and Israelis will be fine after this over, but the Qataris will definitely try to save Hamas, but it's not going to work. Now, what about the day after? Look, Hamas is not going to be the ruler of Gaza in the day after. That's quite clear. It might survive as a concept, as an organization, sure, but the rule of Hamas is gone. Uh, the Palestinian Authority will be unfortunately resurrected with some new blood. I don't know who's going to take over it. We'll see. Uh, Iran ties to the Gazan people, to the Gaza infrastructure is virtually gone. Qatar influence will remain through this Israeli relationship post-Hamas. And up in the north, Hezbollah will be back dealing with their own mess. They have a huge opposition, huge problems back home. They don't need this war. So once this thing gets wrapped up, Hezbollah is going to basically back off. Now, the Houthi rebels, I don't know if they survived this or not in one configuration because they're being slammed into eight pieces by the U.S. coalition. We'll see. Egypt will definitely play ball with the U.S. and Israel in the region, in Gaza, post-Hamas. I've explained why. And the Abraham Accords are on the rise. In fact, they're already operational. We just need to see the official acceptance of these accords. But this attack, the October 7th attack, literally took down Iranian influence in the region, broke multiple proxies for them, caused massive internal mayhem for Iran, huge problems for Hezbollah, and brought the Abraham Accords all the way to the front of the agenda for this entire region. And most importantly, and kind of overlooked here, it actually got the U.S., to get its act together for the first time in 20 years in the region. So I would say this was a very unrewarding exercise for Iran. 
Now, as always, these videos are not fully monetized given the nature of what we're saying here. I get it. I totally understand. No problem. If you would be one of the supporters of this channel, I'd really appreciate it. There's a way you can do it. You can either become a channel member or you can join our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Tom Nash report. And even if you're not, it's fine. Just watch the videos, enjoy them, share them with people who actually want to expand their mind about what's going on here. Thank you so much. I'll see you in the next one.